Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Khmer Score studio. Welcome to the show. So, really quick, if you haven't seen my most recent episode on Tano Psalm Survivor, well, okay, most recent spoiler episode, because uh, this was from like two days ago, but today's official spoiler season, even though we've already gotten some spoilers, regardless, spoiler season is here. <laughs> Make sure you check that episode at some point, but stay tuned to this episode first, because he's finally here. My goodness, Magic players have been waiting for such a long time for this character to finally get a card. And believe me, it was worth the wait. So with all that said, well, first blame Eddie in the comments below in case I make any mistakes, because if I do, it's always Eddie's fault, and not mine. And let's jump into it. That's right, Gix is here. Gix, Yogmoth, Praetor, A33, Phyrexian Praetor. Go figure, it's a Praetor. Anyways, that costs one black black. He has, whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may pay one life. If they do, they draw a card. On top of that, pay four black, 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 discard X cards, exile the top X cards of target opponent's library. You may play lands and cast spells from one cards, exile this way without paying their mana costs. So there is quite a bit going on here, but first up, I mean, unlike other Phyrexian Praetors, Gix is very, um, uh, nice to your opponents? Uh, let, let's just say that nice in a way. Because other Phyrexian Praetors, you know, like, you know, Elish Norn or, you know, uh, Jenga Taxis, they always have, you know, a massive, you know, upside for you and a massive downside for your opponents. But this one is like, hey, no, 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 no. Everyone, 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 okay? As long as we're attacking people I don't like, in including all of you attacking each other, that, that, that's what I'm saying, um, that's fine. You can get a benefit too. Now your opponents, you know, unless they're playing like an Edric Spymaster Dress deck, and, and if that's the case, you might not want to play this deck anyways, but your opponents aren't going to get the same amount of benefit that you are going to get out of this commander because, well, um, you're going to build your entire deck around this commander. You're going to build around that ability to just draw a ton of cards that trigger to draw cards just by hitting your opponents. So you're going to have a lot of low to ground evasive creatures. Whereas again, unless your opponent is playing like Edric, they probably aren't going to have that many low to the ground evasive creatures that can really take advantage of something like this. Now your opponent still will get some benefits out of this. Yes, one life for one card is great. But again, your opponents are also having to do you some favors, essentially, to get that benefit. They've got to hit each other. So your opponent's life totals are going to be going down quite quickly with this kind of a commander, with you dishing out some pain with your creatures, and your opponents, you know, kind of hurting themselves and drawing some cards, while also hurting other players. Yeah, there's a lot of pain going around. Speaking of pain, though, what really sells me about this commander is that ability. My goodness. Seven mana, hey, let's discard a ton of cards, let's exile a ton of cards off the top of someone else's library, and we just get to play them all, essentially. Now, correct me in the comments below if I'm wrong on this, but it does say play land, so I'm assuming you can only, like, kind of play that as a land for turn, you're not just putting it onto the battlefield. So, yeah, if you haven't done your land drop yet, cool, you get that, but, I mean, what really matters is being able to cast all the spells off the top of their library without paying their mana cost. Essentially, this is a commander that reminds me of one of my favorite magic cards of all time. And in fact, I've got an entire deck built around that very specific magic card. But yeah, this commander essentially is like, hey, uh, let's just, you know, get a lot of low to ground evasive creatures out. Let's swing out, you know, draw a ton of cards. Probably maybe have a way to, you know, not, ha not to have to discard cards. We'll talk about that here in a bit too. A and then, yeah, discard a ton of cards and just destroy someone, well, and, and all your other opponents too, with a ton of your opponent's cards off the top of their library. So again, this is a very, you know, nice commander for your opponents. It benefits them, right? Uh, in a way, sure, until you're like, hey, uh, now fun time's over. Let's dominate with your cards. But yeah, I think this commander has a ton of potential. I think a lot of players out there are going to be really excited about it. And with that said, if you are one of those players that are excited about this brand new commander, the very first Gix we've ever seen, make sure you check out that card list link in the description below. It's got all the cards I'm going to be talking about on this episode. And yeah, if you want to build around this commander, consider picking up some of those cards sooner rather than later because, yeah, when new exciting commanders like this one are spoiled, sometimes cards that work really well with them tend to go up in price. And, and yeah, 
With all that said, let's jump into those cards. Now, okay, first, I guess this is not a card that is going to go in this deck because it, well, can't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, there's some inspiration from Villainous Wealth for this commander. One of my favorite cards of all time. Again, X, black, green, blue. So yeah, just a massive X spell where you want to dump a ton of mana into it. Or, you know, like my deck wants to do also, you know, copy it a ton of times. Regardless, Target Opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. You may cast a number of non land cards with converted mana costs X less than mine without paying their mana cost. So essentially kind of the same thing, except, you know, you can't play lands. Now you do have to discard your hand to actually you know, do the new Gix one. And actually, I probably should have mentioned, yeah, I mean, that can be a very risky play. But of course, there are ways to kind of mitigate that risk or actually even benefit from discarding your hand. So whereas the trade-off for Villainous Wealth is that you need to dump a ton of mana into it, the trade-off for Gix is that, yeah, if you've got a massive hand, you can essentially convert that into whatever's on the top of your opponent's library. Regardless, first, we need to actually get to that massive hand. And like I mentioned, yeah, a bunch of low-to-the-ground evasive creatures that can get through on our opponents are going to work out great in this kind of a deck. Like, you know, a Changeling Outcast is fantastic. It is a Changeling, which, um, I mean, probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, it can be every creature, or it is every creature type. But the important part is, it's a 1-1 one -one for a single black mana that can't block and can't be blocked. Now, it doesn't really matter that it can't block. What we care about is, again... This just is unblockable. Our opponents cannot block it. Therefore, this is kind of like, hey, uh, in combination with our commander, automatic, guaranteed card draw every single turn as long as this stays on the board and as long as this can keep getting through on opponents. Which, of course, it will because it's unblockable. Anyways, next up, Vampire Cutthroat. A another fantastic low-to-the-ground creature again. Single mana, 1-1. One, one. Skulk and lifelink. Now, that lifelink is nice because it's going to gain us back the life that it's going to lose for hitting an opponent and letting us draw that card. But yeah, Skulk basically is going to be unblockable in a lot of situations against a lot of players. It can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. So unless your creature has something that only has one power, they're not going to be able to block it. And of course, Flying is another fantastic form of evasion. And yeah, he'll hope a gear pour or other, you know, low to the ground creatures. You know, a 1-1 one, one for a single mana. Flying, great. Just get it out. Swing it to your opponents, and uh, sure, okay, Hope of Gear Pour also has Sacrifice it until your next turn. Target players dealt combat damage by Hope of Gear Pour this turn. Can't cast on creature spells. So, I guess if you're worried about them trying to stop you from doing something, cool, you can sacrifice it. But yeah, if not, again, I mean, not guaranteed, you know, one extra card drawn per turn. But it's really, really likely that you're going to be able to do so. Next up, how about that old mechanic that I don't think they use anymore, actually. I think they shelved it. Uh, yeah, Fear, a 1-1. One, one. Prickly Bogart for a black has fear. Basically what that means, that this creature can't be blocked except by artifact creatures and or black creatures. And yeah, I mean, there's bound to be at least one player that meets that requirement that doesn't have those kinds of creatures, so have fun getting through. Or how about another keyword that we can see on Shadow Alley Denizen? Whenever another black creature enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gains intimidate until end of turn. Again, it can't be blocked except by artifact creatures and or creatures that share a color with it. So, um, yeah, again, basically the exact same thing as fear for the vast majority of creatures in this deck, you know, except for, you know, like, hope you're poor, but still, <laughs> basically, yeah, they can't be blocked unless they're being blocked by an artifact or a black creature. Chances are pretty likely it's going to be able to happen. And of course, we're going to have a ton of low to the ground black creatures that we can get into play to get this trigger. And yeah, we can spread that out. We don't have to just target Shadow Alley Denizen with that. We could also target, you know, maybe Hope of Gear Poor. If an opponent, you know, all opponents have flyers. Oh no! Uh, well, now I have an intimidating flyer, so it's probably going to be able to get through at least one of you too. And even a keyword like we see on Vampire the Dire Moon can be very helpful. A 1-1 one, one for a black mana with Death Touch and a Lifelink. Now, like I mentioned earlier, yeah, Lifelink is nice. That can basically replace the life that we're going to lose for drawing that card. But yeah, Death Touch is even a way that we can get through with creatures. If opponents don't have creatures that they want to lose just by blocking our tiny little 1-1. One, one, they're not going to block it because this can take any of them out, essentially. Or if we really need to keep it back for blocking, it can be a fantastic blocker for us as well. Moving on, though, let's go up to some really mana-intensive cards at two mana. Oh my goodness. Dothy Voidwalker. Yeah, decently expensive. I believe $6 or so these days. But yeah, I mean, two mana. This thing does everything, essentially. But at the very least, it's a 3-2 with Shadow. So essentially, yeah, this uh, is not going to be able to be blocked by pretty much anything. Because Shadow means that this creature can only block and be blocked by creatures with Shadow. So uh, chances are very unlikely that your opponents will have a creature with Shadow. 
And on top of that, I mean, Dothy does a ton of things. If a card would put an opponent's graveyard from anywhere instead of exile, they void counter on it. And you can tap and sacrifice it to basically, you know, cast any of those cards, play any of those cards, whatever they are with, you know, void counters on them, play one of them. It's a gross card, okay? Anyways, speaking of gross, Nether Trader. Nether Trader is a 1-1 with haste and shadow, so it can swing right away and again is basically unblockable. On top of that, though, it has whatever other creature is put in your graveyard from the battlefield. You may pay black. If you do, return Nether Trader from your graveyard to the battlefield. Now, with this kind of a commander, we might want to consider some cards like this one that actually can have some utility, even if we are discarding them from our hand with our commander's, you know, massive ability. Because with Nether Trader, well, we can just get this back. And speaking of getting it back, well, how about Blood Gas? That's another one to potentially consider again for this kind of line of play. Yet another creature that we can get back. Landfall, whenever it land is about under control, you may return Blood Gas from your graveyard to the battlefield. So just make sure you're keeping those things in mind as well. I mean, also maybe cards with, you know, madness or flashback, etc., etc., etc. Ways to interact, you know, with graveyard or discarding cards can be huge once we utilize our commander's massive ability. And speaking of utilizing that ability, well, one other commander, but one that can be great in a deck like this one, if you've got the budget for it, Karak Son of Yawgmoth or Crick Son of Yawgmoth. I know, no idea how to actually say that one. I've always messed up on it. I'm so sorry. Please let me in the comments below. Anyways, for each black and a cost, you may pay two life out and pay that mana. And whenever you cast a black spell, you get a counter and crick, which is nice because it has lifelink. Nevertheless, I mean, first up, we have, you know, all those creatures that are incredibly low to the ground and many of them cost just a single black mana. Uh, we can just basically play those for free. And when we do so, uh, we are going to be moving really quickly with a deck like this. Because then we can draw into more, and then you'll play them for free, essentially. We can just really flood the board very quickly. Yes, at the cost of life, but, uh, yeah, we've got ways to get life, too. We'll talk about it here in a bit. But with this as well, we can heavily reduce the cost of our commander's activated ability. Again, normally it's for black, 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 but it basically just turns it into four Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black, Phyrexian Black. So yeah, four and six life, essentially. Which, of course, is a lot cheaper to activate, and we can do multiple things on that turn then that we are going to be activating it if we need to. So just something to consider when it comes to saving mana on that. Other things to consider, again, are ways to actually benefit from discarding cards. Like, you know, the Bone Miser, which can be incredible with this kind of a commander. It has, whenever you discard a creature card, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Whenever you discard a land card, add black black. Whenever you discard a non-creature, non-land card, draw a card. Obviously, all these can be incredibly beneficial to you because, yeah, I mean, you're going to be discarding a ton of cards with your commander's ability. I mean, normally you'd probably, you know, go to combat, swing out, you know, with all your creatures, get a ton of cards, you know, from your creatures hitting your opponents and losing some life for that. Then you activate your ability and you discard, say, let's say, I don't know, 14 cards or whatnot, a ton of cards off the top of your opponent's library, and also some massive benefits from this. By discarding creature cards, you're adding to your army to potentially draw you even more cards in the future. By discarding land cards, you get a massive influx of mana. And by discarding non-creature non-land, you can replace a lot of the cards in your hand and then utilize that mana, of course, for those cards. So yeah, Bone Miser can really have a massive impact once you're set up. Another card with a massive impact, though, is Bag of Holding. It says whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard by paying, you know, two and you can tap it and loot, which is nice. But more importantly, by paying four and tapping it, you can sacrifice it or turn all cards exile with it back to their owner's hand. Basically, hey, you know that hand that you just discarded to get a massive benefit by, you know, casting things off the top of your opponent's library, basically, you know, villainous wealthing them? Um, you get that hand back. You can just get it right back with Bag of Holding by paying the four mana tapping and sacrificing it. So, yeah, this kind of by itself can take down that massive downside from your commander making you discard your hand. Or not discarding your hand. It is, you know, discard X cards. You can keep certain cards in your hand, but come on, discard your hand. Go for it. And of course, yeah, you can also benefit from Feast of Sanity, or by benefit, I mean, well, uh, also hurt an opponent as well. Whenever you discard a card, Feast of Sanity deals one damage to any target, and you gain one life. So yeah, again, if you discard, say, 14 cards, that's a ton of damage to distribute. Uh, I mean, most of the time, you might just put it, you know, at someone's face, which is great, and you could probably take out a player by doing that, and also gain a ton of life in the process. So yeah, make sure you are considering ways to actually benefit from utilizing that ability to the fullest. 
Also, to actually utilize that to the fullest, well, you're probably also going to want to have, you know, no maximum hand size. So let's quickly talk about cards like, you know, Reliquary Tower, Thought Vessel, and Decanter of Endless Water. Reliquary Tower is a very simple land that works great in monocolor decks especially, and especially this one, you have no maximum hand size. Tap for color. So yeah, having a maximum hand size is huge for this kind of a commander, because again, you're going to be able to draw an absurd amount of cards with your low to the ground creatures that can keep getting through. And uh, yeah, you're going to want to hold on to those cards to really benefit from that ability. Or, you know, Thought Vessel, a great mana rock that needs to keep getting reprinted into Oblivion, so it's finally budget friendly. Uh, we'll see if that ever happens. Anyways, you have to make some hand size. Cost two, taps for colors. Uh, also, Decanter Bendless Water. Basically the exact same thing. You can tap for one of any color, so therefore it costs one more. But yeah, you have to make some hand size. Finally, we get a budget version, essentially, of Thought Vessel. But yeah, I, I would really like it uh, if we got a two mana mana rock uh, like Thought Vessel. That got reprinted in Oblivion for that number of maximum hand size. Please, Wizards! Thank you. But yeah, again, being able to hold onto your hand can be crucial with this commander and to fully utilize that Villainous Wealth ability. Also, um, I, I did mention earlier that we really want to take more advantage of uh, our commander's trigger than our opponent's. And of course we can because we're building around, you know, that ability itself. But we can also make it so that ability uh, hurts them a bit more to utilize. That trigger hurts them a bit more with cards like, you know, Underworld Dreams or Faded Raveler or Obnixless the Hate Twisted. Underworld Dreams says whenever opponent draws a card, Underworld Dreams deals one damage to that player. And Fan and Reveler basically does the exact same thing, and so does Obnixless the Hate Twisted. On top of Obnixless having minus two destroy target creatures, controller draws two cards, which is quite funny. Anyways, these are some additional ways to punish our opponents for drawing any cards, you know, including you know, the one their draw step. But also, hey, if you're going to take advantage of, you know, attacking other opponents, and utilizing my commander's trigger to draw cards, there's an extra price to that because those cards are going to come at an extra damage for each one of these. And if you have multiple of these on the field, uh, that, that's a ton of life your opponents are losing essentially, whereas you are just losing again one life for one card, which is fantastic. Speaking of punishing your opponents, well, Wound Reflection, of course, can be great for that. At the beginning of each end step, each opponent loses life with life they lost this turn. So, of course, I mean, by you swinging out at your opponents or, you know, opponents swinging out at each other to, you know, draw a ton of cards, well, that's going to cause a lot of pain. It's also going to cause even more pain, again, when they utilize that trigger to draw cards and lose life based on the number of creatures that they're having hit. Or I should say specifically whichever ones they want. Anyways, you know what I mean. Wound Reflection can be very impactful with a deck like this. But of course, things can get even more painful with Psychosis Crawler, a great card in this deck. First up, it's Power and Toughness to reach equal number of cards in your hand. So this thing can become incredibly massive, especially if you've got no maximum hand size. But more importantly, whenever you draw a card, each opponent loses one life. Again, you can draw a ton of cards very quickly with a deck like this, and yeah, you're going to be draining your opponents out in absolutely no time with a card like this one. Also, make sure you're considering some ways, though, to gain some life, because yeah, I mean, you are also going to be losing life again when you're utilizing your trigger. So yeah, Whip of Variables can be great. Creatures you control have lifelink, and then also it can get creatures back from your graveyard too, essentially, or temporarily get them back. Anyways, yeah, lifelink can be crucial in getting some life back, but of course, there are plenty of other ways to get life back within mono black now one other way that you might want to benefit though from your opponents actually drawing cards might be with mind's eye it says whenever an opponent draws a card you may pay one if you do draw a card so now your opponents yes are benefiting from hitting your other opponents which you already i guess benefit from because your opponents are taking each other out but of course on top of that now you can just pay a single mana to draw a card when they do so now you can just take advantage of the cards that they're drawing without that life loss too so yeah there are plenty of fantastic ways to really make the most out of this commander but now as this episode is coming to a close it's time for me to give you my final thoughts on gix yog moth freighter i really like the design of this card again it's unlike the other phyrexian praetors where those are kind of more so like okay massive benefit massive you know uh detriment to your opponents this one's more so like no, 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 no. I'm helping everyone. Look, everyone, you can draw cards. Great. Just hit each other. And then you're also like, well, okay, you know what? Maybe there's some more downsides to you doing that. Or maybe I get more of an upside to you doing that. Or maybe I just, you know, hurt you all for drawing more cards myself. But ultimately, all I really want to do is get an absurd amount of cards in my hand and then villainous wealth a player and then take you all out with that player's cards. 
because Villainous Wealth is a ton of fun. Well, at least for you. Anyways, yeah, I, I think a lot of players, including myself, are going to be excited about this commander. And, and yeah, if you are one of those players, make sure you check out that card list link in the description below. Because again, when new exciting commanders like this one are spoiled, especially ones that players have been waiting for for such a long time, we finally have Gicks. Sometimes cards that work well that commander tend to go up in price sooner or later. So yeah, consider picking up some of those cards. And also, make sure you're staying tuned to this channel for even more exciting quick takes and spoilers coming up because Brothers War spoiler season is finally here. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are. And as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support.